Uh, let me talk about one other uh, project because I think this is uh, also important. Um, um, if you have participated in a teleconference call, mm -hmm. you know that this is probably one of the worst experiences yeah, of your yeah. life. You, you can't hear the person on the other end. You can't um, uh, break in. There, there are a lot of things that are very different from a face-to-face -face meeting. Mm -hmm. uh, what we want to do, or, or, or and, and, and Josh Atkins is, uh, is uh, leading uh, this project, we want to be able to make uh, 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 remote collaborations as friendly and as seamless as face-to-face. -face. Mm -hmm. Okay, now there are many aspects to this, but so let me just talk about one. The current system for telecommunications Everything comes out of one little loudspeaker that's sitting on your on your table somewhere. Mm -hmm. Now, we have two years for purpose. Yeah. And the two years uh, do a number of things, but the most important thing that it does is that it, it allows you to to Try directional it. hearing. Yeah. You know, to find a sound source, right? But it also does something else, and if you want to try this sometimes, just in any space when people are talking, just put your finger in one ear and listen. And things get really mushy and garbly when you do that. And so the processing that goes on internally with the two signals are in a sense like vision in that with two eyes you get depth information, and with two ears you also get depth information. The, the, the equivalent, it's not exactly yeah, yeah. E equivalent, but it is indeed um, a, a simple explanation of, of what's going on there. And so what we're doing is to, um, uh, this is in a collaboration with a colleague at, at Georgia Tech, uh, what we want to do is to uh, uh, take advantage of what we know about human factors and to build a system for remote collaboration that will give you everything but the sense of smell mm. of what's going on. You, you, we want to bring you the ambiance of the room that the people that you're talking within and vice versa. We want to send the ambiance uh, from, uh, from, from our end. And um, uh, also we want to, we're doing this over the internet protocol. The reason we're using the internet protocol is because of the additional bandwidth that we can get. Mm -hmm. uh, POTS is extremely band limited, so you can get sound that sounds mm -hmm. very cruddy. And so yeah. we want to give you the full uh, audio spectrum. And, um, and uh, this is just one part of it because, uh, you know, as you can imagine, there are layers upon layers uh, uh, that, that are built into uh, a project uh, mm -hmm. uh, like that data handling, archiving, um, uh, um, uh, and, and so on. Could you talk about any uh, difficulties slash adversity that you faced and how you overcame them just all throughout your entire uh, journey as an inventor? Well, I suppose career would be a better word. But. <laughs> um, I, I think um, one of the hardest things to do is to um, be able to put trash in the garbage can and to understand that to a large extent people are, are ignorant. When, when I'm walk, walking the halls at Bell Labs and somebody opens the lab door and says, I've got two burned out lights, would you replace them? Well, when you when things like that happen, uh, the, the, the natural instinct is to say, I'm your peer, not your servant, mm -hmm. but I learned to say, I'll be right back and just keep walking. Um, <laughs> uh, and, um, and, uh, and, and the reason is because then this doesn't clutter my mind. It doesn't, doesn't hang me. I, you know, I know why he asked me. He asked me because most of the people of color who are walking the halls, that's their responsibility. Their service 
people-oriented people. I mean, we're very heavy, even here at Hopkins, it's the same phenomena. Uh, most of the people of color that you see here are um, providing services uh, for, for the rest of us. And, and so uh, when I'm confused with people of that nature, um, I, I tend to always try not to be upset, to, to, to allow it to upset me and to put it in the right pew and, and keep going. Yeah. I don't know whether that answers your question or not. No, that, that works. Yeah. Could you, uh, could you share an interesting story or stories about the process of uh, research and invention? Um, that just, uh, any, anything interesting from the last time? Uh, well, um, uh, the, I, I think probably the most interesting one is how I got started in this whole business. I, um, I had an intern at Bell Labs, and um, th there were a group of acousticians that were uh, trying to measure the interoral time delay. And by that, if I present a click followed by another click, what is the spacing between those two clicks before you hear two, two clicks, clicks yeah, right? Yeah. And it turns out that the integration time of the ear is somewhere around 15 milliseconds. Mm -hmm. Well, they were trying to, to measure this in subjects using uh, condenser microphones in reverse. In reverse? Yeah, to, instead of using them to pick up sound, to have them generate sound. Oh, okay, uh, yeah. there, there's a, there are reciprocal devices, meaning that they most transducers will go both ways, yeah. more efficient in one direction than in the others, and, and other in most cases. Um, and so my assignment for the summer was to see what I could do to help these this team. And so um, I went to the library and found a paper in a German publication that described solid dielectric headphones. Mm. Wow, so I um, um, uh, went to the machine shop and got some parts made, put these things together, and, and, and won a gold star right away because this really solved the, this team's uh, problems. Mm -hmm. And so um, I, you know, went back to school very happy and got a call in November saying that, you know, she was these uh, these transducers are dying. They're mostly not sensitive. I don't know, we built 10 pairs of them or something like that. I says, oh, that's very interesting. So I went back and read the rest of the paper mm -hmm. and found out that uh, 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 Kulshaw and Schroeder definitely described the fact that these uh, devices work well for a certain period of time and then they die off. Mm -hmm. And so, um, uh, and they offered some remedies for that, like reverse the polarity of the voltage. And so I, but this wouldn't work in that particular case. So I, you know, said, why don't you send me a ticket? I'll come up and take a look at these things. And so I uh, went back and took the battery out. And I had an oscillator, the headphone, and, and, and a battery. Took the battery out, and the lead fell across the oscillator and the transducer. And it sang beautifully. <laughs> so, uh, you know, okay, so it's a capacitor. This means that it's stored some charge somewhere. Let me short circuit the thing. Mm -hmm. Short circuited it, plugged it back in, it still worked. <laughs> <laughs> so, hmm, what's going on here? Well, to make a long story short, that's basically how I discovered the electrets and, and, and what it all meant and, and the fact that. Um, that up until our work, uh, I think Faraday summed it up the best of, of anyone else, and that is that it's a very interesting phenomenon and perhaps it's only used to teach electrostatics to physics students. <laughs> and up until that point, from the standpoint of, uh, of, of long-lasting applications, it's not to say people didn't try to use electrodes before, but unsuccessfully. We were the first to show that you can that this can be a permanent